A reading from Genesis, the birth of Ishmael. Now Sarai, Abram's wife, bore him no children. She had an Egyptian slave girl whose name was Hagar. And Sarai said to Abram, You see that the Lord has prevented me from bearing children. Go into my slave girl. It may be that I shall obtain children by her. And Abram listened to the voice of Sarai. So after Abram had lived for ten years in the land of Canaan, Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar the Egyptian, her slave girl, and gave her to her husband Abram as a wife. He went into Hagar and she conceived. And when she saw that she had conceived, she looked with contempt on her mistress. Then Sarai said to Abram, May the wrong done to me be on you. I gave my slave girl to your embrace. And when she saw that she had conceived, she took on me, she looked on me with contempt. May the Lord judge between you and me. But Abram said to Sarai, Your slave girl is in your power. Do to her as you please. Then Sarai dealt harshly with her, and she ran away from her. The angel of the Lord found her by a spring of water in the wilderness, the spring on the way to Shur. And he said, Hagar, slave girl of Sarai, where have you come from, and where are you going? She said, I am running away from my mistress, Sarai. The angel of the Lord said to her, return to your mistress and submit to her. The angel of the Lord also said to her, I will so greatly multiply your offspring that they cannot be counted for the multitude. And the angel of the Lord said to her, Now you have conceived and shall bear a son. You shall call him Ishmael, for the Lord has given heed to your affliction. He shall be a wild ass of a man, with his hand against everyone, and everyone's hand against him, and he shall live at odds with all his kin. So she named the Lord who spoke to her, You are El Roy. For she said, Have I really seen God and remained alive after seeing him? Therefore the well was called Ber Laharoi. It lies between Kadesh and Bered. Hagar bore Abram a son, and Abram named his son, whom Hagar bore, Ishmael. Abram was 86 years old when Hagar bore him, Ishmael. The word of the Lord. I invite you to stand as you are able or as you wish for a reading from the gospel according to Mark. From there, Jesus set out and went away to the region of Tyre. He entered a house and did not want anyone to know he was there. Yet he could not escape notice, but a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit immediately heard about him, and she came and bowed down at his feet. Now, the woman was a Gentile of Syrophoenician origin. She begged him to cast out the demon out of her daughter. He said to her, let the children be fed first, for it is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. But she answered him, sir, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. Then Jesus said to her, for saying that, you may go. The demon has left your daughter. So she went home, found the child lying on the bed, and the demon gone. You may be seated. When I preached um, in Houston for seven years, sometimes I preached down in the aisle like this, and sometimes I went up to the pulpit, and I didn't always make a super conscious choice about when I was doing which. Honestly, I more went to the pulpit when I needed more notes. 
Um, the pastors in the audience know what I'm talking about. Um, but one of my congregation members said, Pastor Lura, when you climb up in that pulpit, I know we're going to hear a different kind of sermon. Because you climb up in that pulpit when you are claiming your authority to tell us something. So today, in my protest clothes, I'm going to climb up in that pulpit. And and not, of course, to have authority over you, my sisters and brothers and siblings, but to claim my authority on behalf of all of us. To say to the world that our bodies and our words and our lives are good and holy and given to us by God, given to us by God. That the bodies of women, including transgender women, the bodies of Anyone who's been affected by sexism, the body of trans people, the body of gender non-conforming people are good and holy and created by God and our lives and our words matter. And that any system that is set up to say that they don't is a demonic system. That patriarchy, which hurts women and trans people and gender non-conforming people and men who didn't, don't fit the mold and even men who do fit the mold that patriarchy is demonic and that sexism is a sin. Yeah. And I'm going to say this even though the Bible doesn't have the words that say that sexism is a sin. And I'm going to say this even though there's patriarchy in the Bible. Because I'm going to say this because when I read scripture and when I read scripture with you, I meet a God who sees what happens to us and knows what happens to us and sets us free. Because when I read that story of Hagar, there's a line that I'm going to cross out that I don't think is canonical, but the rest of that story, (laughs) that line about go back to your mistress, I think someone else wrote that in later. I read a story about a woman who was objectified. Do you know that her name, Hagar, the name that we have, in Hebrew it means the thing. We don't know her name. They called her the thing. She was objectified. And her womb was used against her will, her uterus. Let's use the real words. She was forced to bear a child that we don't know if she chose or not, she had no say in what happened there, that her reproductive system was not hers, it belonged to someone else, and she was harassed and she was abused, and God saw her. And God spoke to her, and God knew what happened to her. And she gets to name God. She's one of the few people in scripture who looks at God and says, I can give you a name. You are the one who sees me. Or sometimes the Hebrews ambiguous, the God I see. Moses barely got to see God's butt crack. (laughs) The patriarchs didn't get to see God, but Hagar did. And we have a God in our scripture. We have a Christ in our scripture that listens to the words of women and is converted by the words of women. That Syrophoenician woman, she taught Jesus something and Jesus listened to her. So I am convinced that in scripture, We have a God who sees us, who sees our oppression, who created us good and holy and made us in God's image, male and female. And you know what? If God is both male and female and God created some of us in God's image with different mixtures of male and female, they might be representing God better than those of us who claim only one side of that equation. That sexism is a sin that God knows and God sees. 
Now, there's other sins in these stories, right? Hagar was not oppressed only by Abram. Hagar was oppressed by Sarai as well, right? Um, and uh, that's something that we have to struggle with and that we've seen this March struggle with, right? That we've seen the creation of this March struggle with. And um, white women to white women in here, um, we got to work on how to be more inclusive and we got to work on sins of racism. We got to work on all kinds of other ways of inclusivity. We got to work on making sure that we include people with disabilities. We got to make sure that we're looking at economic rights. We got to make sure that we're looking at immigration rights. Because you know what? I am all about um, justice for all people and justice for all women. And I'm not particularly interested in a movement that is um, justice for respectable, well-educated, um, able-bodied, cisgender, straight white women. That's not the name of this march, is it? That um, women's rights includes women's rights to make sure that their um, sons and their daughters are safe in the streets and don't get shot inappropriately in the street. That's part of women's rights. It's part of women's rights to say that women ought to be able to be reunited with their families in... Um, immigration battles, that we ought to be able to move and to live where we need to live in the world. It's part of women's rights to say that people in wheelchairs or people who are neurodiverse ought to be able to work if they need to and get around and go to restaurants and be able to fully function. Disability rights are part of women's rights and um, it's part of women's rights to say that people of all um, genders are included in the diversity of God's people and the diversity of our citizenship and that there are sins that we need to look at and address beyond sexism, sins like transphobia and sins like homophobia and sins like racism and sins like nativism and um, thinking our country comes first and sins, all kinds of stuff that God sees and knows too. God sees and knows too. And I see in scripture um, a whole lot of women who talk back. Do you see that in those stories? That, that these women, these women talk. These women talk. And um, here's the place where I think that it's really, really, really good for those of us who are relatively privileged white women, in which I include myself, to learn from all these other intersectional groups um, how to resist the evil that's done to us, because some people have a lot more experience than we do, right? Some people have lived in a country that they feel like has always hated them. Some people have um, lived in a country where they have grown up resisting structures that really um, hamper their way of life in a way that those of us who are relatively privileged, we, have, we experience some sexism, but, but uh, we're in a new world that we've never experienced before, that, but there are people who know how to resist, who've been resisting a long time. There are people who um, grew up in with their families being told, this is how you have self-dignity um, in your own identity and how you resist the voices from the culture because it's taught to them in their homes and we can learn, right? In this struggle, those of us who are relatively privileged white women can learn from people, women of color can learn from people with disabilities, can learn from immigrant communities, can learn from transgender communities because they've been fighting this all along and we can follow their lead. We can follow their lead. And because there are people who already know how to speak up. You've been practicing speaking up for a long time, like these women in scripture. Like these women in scripture. The Syrophoenician woman whose name we don't even know, she says, but Jesus, but Jesus, you're wrong about that. She doesn't say it, but it's in there, right? But Jesus, that thing you just said was wrong. You didn't get that right because even the dogs get the crumbs. How dare you not heal my daughter? And Jesus says, yeah. Yeah, Jesus learns. Jesus learns from her. And um, Hagar, she says, I'm going to name God. I'm going to say who God is. And the name that she gives God gets kept in the geography of the place 
The name that she says, I'm going to name God the one that sees me, or maybe the name, the God that I see, um, then that becomes the name of a well in that geography, right? She changes the surface, the way that we name the surface of the land by the way that she names God, and she speaks up. So for all the women who are non-compliant and not submissive and not polite and not nice, and all the women who wish that we could be but have been socialized to be a lot quieter than we'd like to be, there is holy truth here, holy truth in seeing women speak up and seeing God listen to them. That when we speak up about the things that have happened to us, the ways that our voices have been silenced, the way that our bodies have been controlled by someone else, the way that our work has not been valued, the way that our families have not been cared for, when we speak up, God listens. So how dare the people not listen? How dare the people not listen when we speak up? As a matter of fact, when we speak up, people of God, siblings, when we speak up, God speaks with us. When we move out into the streets to march, God moves in our bodies. Our bodies. God moves in them. God shows up when we come together and go out there and hold our signs and speak our words and listen to our speeches and take over those streets. God shows up with and for us in our bodies and in our words. Because sexism is a sin and patriarchy is an oppression and God sets people free. And Christ is showing up. God is showing up in your body and mine as we hit the streets today, as we say our words, as we live our lives. Praise be to God. Amen.